Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get lit, we get fly, we talk stuff, we get high. But to the masses, we're just a podcast called Verified. I'm your host. I am Joe Paul, and we are with a truly amazing individual. I have searched the world for a Jew that is somewhere in my stratosphere of the type of person that I am. And if there is anyone that is the closest to embodying who I am as a Jew, it is this guy. Cool guy, Paulie Faust. How are you, my brother? I am amazing. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, honored to be on and honored that we finally got to uh, break some bread together in person. It's been uh, absolutely. It's awesome. yeah, yeah. Listen, getting to break matzah with my fellow Jews is definitely the way to go. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a it was a pleasure to meet you. And I'm actually going to start out, you know, with a very, very profound thing that you said. And it's going to stick with me for a while. And uh, I feel like it needs to be put on a shirt and I might steal it, you know, but uh, I'll give you you know credit for it. Uh, you said. Walking into a room full of people with a crowd of strangers that were all best friends. That shit, that shit hit me. I was just like, oh my God. I was like, somebody take a mic, drop it, throw it fucking off a balcony because that was, that was amazing. So that really stuck with me. And I felt exactly what you meant because when walking into that room, it was like, oh shit. It's like, I mean, it's like understanding the characters of a book. And then actually getting to meet them in person. It's like, oh, shit. It's like, how are you? So uh, I, I felt exactly what you felt when you said that. And I've been repeating it. I probably repeated it like 10 different times. Because people are like, oh, how did you feel at the conference? I was like, it was like walking into a, a room filled with people, a crowd of strangers, and we were all best friends. And I it, put, it was, quote, unquote, Paulie Faust. I felt it the second I got there. Now, there, some of it were people that I... I followed, I was fanboying, like I was, I was into, I loved, I loved their message. And I was like, oh my God, it's you. Others were people I had never met, but we were automatically close. There wasn't a feeling out period of who is this person? Should I be friends with them? We were all there for a common cause, different age groups, different backgrounds, sexual orientations, blah, 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 all just with this love and it was amazing. It wasn't like, oh, do I need to talk to who? Everyone just wanted to talk to everybody. Um, it was such a cool feeling to be around that. Um, you don't get it often. And I, and I I knew I was right about it when we were back at the hotel the first night having some drinks. And these two Israeli uh, girls walked in the hotel who were not here for the conference. They were in New York for a separate event. So they weren't with us, didn't even know we were there. And when they walked in the hotel, they, they came over and they said, we walked in and we felt a love. We felt an, an energy in the lobby and we had to come over and find out what you guys were about. And that was this group. Um, so I, I was so honored to, to have gone and met these unbelievable humans all doing different things, but for one reason. So And that's, I, the, I was, and that's the combat anti-Semitism. It's like we were all there, not because we have the same enemy, but we're fighting for the same cause. There's, there's a big difference. When you get together, you know, it's like, and I don't want to generalize the other side. Actually, I do want to generalize the other side. <laughs> the reason that they the reason that they have come together is because they feel they have a similar enemy with the Jewish people in the state of Israel rather than a similar cause, which is to liberate the Palestinians, you know, whatever exactly that means. So, um, yeah, when I stepped out of the elevator and it was like, Joe Paul, Joe Paul, I was like, yeah, I'm fucking home, baby. I was like, right. this is, this is I, our I had, uh, yeah, I had the strongest sense. I, I mean, this might sound corny to some people, but unless you've experienced it, you really don't know. I had the strongest sense of belonging that yes. I've ever had in my life. Now, I've been in hip hop, you know, since I was like 16 years old. And, and the people that, uh, that I'm associated with, I consider my brothers and I'm super close with all of them, you know, for years and years. But the sense of togetherness and belonging that I felt in that room is something that I've never felt in all the years of hip hop. So it was pretty profound. So I'm glad I was able to, you know, share in that experience. So, and, and I'm glad yeah. that, you, uh, that you felt the same way. Yeah, and I want, uh, it's very important what you said that I want people to understand we are fighting anti Semitism. We are not fighting um, the IDF's operation in Gaza right now and the Palestinians because the other side has exposed themselves. Um, if you're upset with the state of Israel and the way they're handling a war against terrorists who attack them, okay, we could agree or disagree on that point. I could assure everyone listening the IDF did not consult me didn't consult you, didn't consult anybody about their strategy. So if you don't like their strategy, okay, you want to talk about that. But 
Because of the IDF's actions against a terror group that committed the worst atrocities since the Holocaust, you're protesting a synagogue in Wisconsin, a Jewish deli in New York. You've exposed yourself. This has nothing to do with the IDF's actions. You're looking for Jews anywhere that you could attack. What does Jews have to do with an independent country, the, the state of Israel, responding to a terror attack and fighting terrorists? What does it have to do with my Jewish daughter on her campus at college? She had nothing to do with it. So you've just exposed yourself for the anti-Semite you are. This is just an excuse to come after us again. Um, and so this exposed people. This didn't make people anti-Semites. It exposed them for who they really were. And that's what right. we're fighting. Right. I feel like there was almost like there was an imaginary wall that was blocking the anti-Semitism from coming out of most people. And then, you know, the chain of events from Kanye to Kyrie to October 7th and everything in between was basically like free reign to like, OK, you know, it's OK to shit on Jews again. It's like I feel like we're in 1938. But the problem is that there's not. a And I know this sounds fucked up, but there's not enough Jews like me and you that are out there that will call people out, that'll get in their faces, that will, you know, tell them like, nah, you ain't going to do shit, buddy. Uh, get the fuck out of here. Free Palestine. Nah, it's expensive to live here. So, you know, they, we nothing's for free in world in this world. So it's um. It is a little frustrating because it's like I do feel like we're fighting like a a war that there is no actual winner. There is there is no there is no happy ending at the end of this. There's going to be a lot more pain before any sort of resolution, you know, comes to fruition. And you know, and speaking on that topic, now we're not military officials. We're just regular citizens. We're just two badass Jews that you know happen to know a thing or two. And you know, um, you know, from what I've learned about your story, you know, you're quite successful. So I'd have to imagine you have you know a good moral compass as well as you know um, a good rationale for anything that you say. You're not just going to spit off at the mouth, you know, some you know some reckless shit. What do you see for us moving forward as far as? any sort of resolution to the conflict do you have any do you have any ideas of what might work what might not work what you think is plausible now the the thing that i run into is that we try to apply our western values our western philosophy our western thought to a region that has similar western values but faces existential threat uh, existential threats from all sides of it like we in this country we, we don't know how it's like mexico and canada are not attacking us and, you know, are not, you know, I mean, maybe they're invading the border a little bit, you know, maybe a little more than a little bit, but, you know, it's not like we have to worry about like rockets, you know, coming from all angles and we have to protect ourselves in that manner. So how do you feel that we even can move forward as a people? What kind of solution do you think might work? Uh, I think there's possibly two options and I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a war strategist. I'm not a geopolitical expert. There's two strategies. You have to wipe out terror and the heads of terror, right? That's important. And that's not just the IDF. That's also America and other countries not funding these countries like Iran, who basically take the money, don't give it to the people and use it for themselves and use it to fund terror. We know that for a fact. We know who's funding uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis and all the other groups that want to cause harm. And let me be very clear to anyone listening. It's not just Jews in Israel. They hate you too. They hate your way of life and they'll come for you next. So either we wipe that out or we just decide that we're just going to spend the rest of our lives playing a defensive battle. You you stay over there. We'll stay over here. You want to attack us. We'll defend ourselves and hit you sometimes. And then we're in this, this constant state of war, peace, war, peace. And I think people are tired of it. I also think... This is going to take a lot longer to end than people think, because not only do we have to end the fighting, but we also have to, uh, I don't know what the right word is, deprogram the people who have been taught to hate. Now, I don't blame the average young Palestinian coming up. If you're taught from day one to hate, if in your educational material in elementary school, you know, all that, you were shown propaganda, it's all you know. We have to go show a better path. I firmly believe that no one's going to step in and help rebuild um, whatever becomes of Gaza. I think there's an opportunity for Israel to do some work with the right partners to build a, an established place 
you can't have a a a, a, a uh a ruinous country on your border. You can't have a place where no one has a place to live and there's no food. That's just going to breed horror. So I think we got to do something to rebuild the right way together. Um, but, you know, I, I keep going back and forth. They talk about one state solution, two state solution. I'm okay with a two state solution, but in order to have your own state, you have to have government, you have to have products, you have to have industry, you have to have rule of law. And I just don't see that right now. So yeah, and you can't have you can't have like your number one, you know, you know, <laughs> your gross domestic product is based on, on terrorism. Like that that can't be. Like I mean they're all the money sent to you can't go to four or five people so they can live like billionaires and then leave you as cannon fodder. So we need to go after those guys, get that money back to the people it belongs to. Um, I believe at birth, the average, you know, Palestinian child doesn't know, they're taught. And we have to show them a better way. Um, it's not about, um, uh, you know, hatred. It's taught hatred. They are indoctrinated. So we can't fault them, meaning, oh, you know, how do you feel this way? It's all they know. They're not exposed to anything else. You know what um, I relate that to? I, I consider that like um, when you um, when you breed, you know, dogs to fight and uh, – you basically turn that dog into a killer, you know, and sometimes the dog can be rehabilitated, but sometimes the dog has to be put down because it's too far gone. And, and I don't want, and I'm not trying to relate the indoctrinated, the, the, the indoctrinated society. So when people clip this video, be like, look, he's calling us dogs. I'm like, no, but I mean, then again, you guys say that, you know, Israeli dogs rape women. So, I mean, um, <laughs> So you could take whatever you want out of context, but, you know, say it to my face and, you know, we'll have a conversation about it. I don't know how that co good that conversation is going to go <laughs> for you, but um, I kind of feel like it's the same kind of way as, you know, breeding dogs to be fighting dogs. And, you know, sometimes they are capable of rehabilitation and it's they're not to blame. Although if you breed a dog to fight, you know, and be a killer and you let that dog off the leash and then all of a sudden it goes and it kills somebody like you have to understand what you're dealing with before you can actually fight the problem. And I think people are willfully blind and use it as a, as a, a form of conspiracy theory that, you know, it, what the, the, all the schools in UNRWA teach the kids to hate Jews. Yeah. Get out of here. Bullshit. And, oh, and those books that the IDF show that they found, they had those printed up and, you know, this is all Israeli propaganda by the Israeli war machine. That, that is ultimately what we are fighting. We are not fighting Hamas. We are fighting mass disinformation campaign and education. When I see, look, it's one thing if I see um, a, 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 a Palestinian, an American whose, whose family's in Palestine, you know, in Gaza, upset. I get it. Homes have been destroyed. Maybe family members have been destroyed. But when I see um, young American kids at prestigious schools standing for a cause they know nothing about. Nothing about. They don't understand facts. They're being spoon-fed garbage that we dispel all the time. That's what we are truly fighting. We are fighting anti-Semitism. I'm not fighting Hamas. The IDF in Israel is. I'm fighting people who have been brainwashed in this country. And it's an existential threat to our country. That, And we've proven it that when anyone goes to these events and asks these kids, what river to what sea? Uh, who stands for this? They don't know. But they oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think you need to talk to the, the media person. Uh yeah, go, go see the person with the yellow with the yellow vest. Um I mean, yeah, how could you have queers for Palestine and all these groups? You don't know the facts, you've been brainwashed. But I think what most Americans miss, and I've talked about this with a number of people, the enemy we are all, the world, not Jews, the world is fighting. They play a different game. You and I, we think in terms of days, weeks, months. They think in terms of decades. So you and I think about, oh, my God, there's a robber at the door. Let me deal with it. You know, immediate threat. The way they think is, OK, we can't defeat America in a, in a battle with ships and planes. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they said, how can we defeat America? Well, let's have we six, let's have six or seven kids, and let's let's move into the cities, and let's no. take the, let's take it over with the population. We, right, we could start pumping money into universities. We could start getting professors in there who have Marxist views. We can implant them over the next 10, 15 years. 
They will take our high school and college kids and radicalize them. And we will win the battle in 20, 30 years. We will find communities where we can move people to, and then we can nominate people to run for Congress and Senate, and they will win because we will control the majority. majority. And then we will fight them from the inside. They are fighting an asymmetrical war with us, but their time horizon is very different, and their strategy is working because we're like, yeah, it's not happening. They are radicalizing our kids and our campuses with radical professors. We've got to realize we are fighting an asymmetric war. I want to let's talk about the radical professors. So obviously, I mean, if if you follow me on Instagram, um, you know that my knowledge of history is is super extensive. And, and um I, I mean you have no my parents are shocked. They're like, where have you been? Like, how have you known all and I'm like, I just never had the like I I've I've started learning like like 10 years ago because when I when somebody like made a comment to me like that with this is funny, like on social media. Uh, some girl um, wanted to come and see me and she got upset that I wouldn't pay for the plane ticket. So she started calling me like the most racist things in the world. Be like, you, you fucking dirty Jew. That's why you're so cheap. And, and this and that, be like, you should all fucking go back to Spain. And I was like, wait, I was like, go back to Spain. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then I, then I started, then I researched and I was like, we were in Spain. (laughs) I, I was like, and then, and from there, and plus I was, a, you know, I'm a writer for a different hip hop artists and I was writing for an artist from Iraq, from, uh, from Syria and from wow. Lebanon. And, and when I was uh, researching like their, you know, history, just to like, kind of put some like cool nuances into their songs. I'm like, oh shit, the, the, the tribes of David, the, um, the Judean kingdom. I was like, this is like some Indiana Jones shit. And then, and then I really started learning, you know, and, you know, putting, you know, all the, all the history together. So, fuck. Where was I going with this? My stoner brain. Oh, the radical eight, the, uh, our teachers or professors. Okay, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Two of us, baby. We got it. Yeah, I appreciate it. So, I've tracked the origin of the indoctrination and the radicalization to a couple of different events, which actually is quite scary. So, we have one guy by the name of Dr. Rashid Khalidi, who was a Palestinian leader, Arab elite that wrote a book called The Hundred Years' War in Palestine. Okay. His grandson is a professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Columbia University. This book is the contrarian view to everything that Benny Morris and Shlomo Ben-Ami has basically documented with regards to the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 and 1949, as well as the precursor to all of that, starting with the Arab Revolt, in 36 to 39, as well as all the resolutions and the different commissions that were passed, you know, in order to, in order to bring us to where we are today. And this book, the hundred years war is basically like their mind comp. If I could put it into a, a comparison. And whereas they do have a very compelling story, they have a believable story. Unfortunately, their opinion and their view and their perception of who we are and who we were is completely flawed. And that was perpetrated by a guy by the name of Rashid Ryder back in 1898, sending a message to the Palestinians, calling them out, seeing that the Jews are basically inhabiting what is the land of Palestine and warning them that if these weak, pathetic Jews that are being expelled from all these different places in Europe can come here and conquer, you know, the mighty Ottoman Empire and the Arabs of Palestine, then our Islamic heritage might as well be shit. You know, it's all about the preservation of Islamic honor, stemming stemming back to, you know, uh, like the early 8th century when Islam was first founded. So it's like their conquest has been pretty world dominating. And, you know, if we're looking at like, you know, if we're looking at a book of history of, you know, who were like the strongest empires, the Ottoman Empire was very, very strong. And if these weak, pathetic refugee Jews can come here, they're going to turn you into second class citizens. They know so much about society. They're going to turn you all into slaves. And it was that ideology that kept going and intensifying and intensifying. And ultimately, <laughs> there was a lie that Dr. Rashid Khalidi told with regards to uh, the highly contested battle of Deir Yassin, 
where the the claim is that there was a massacre committed by the rogue faction or terrorist group known as the Leahy, you know, with the help of the Ergun, which was another kind of radical military faction. Both of them operated independent of the Haganah, which later turned into the IDF, where this village of Dir Yassin, there was a whole bunch of people killed. There was documented on both sides. Uh, there were better records on the Israeli side because Palestinian records we really can't get to. They didn't really uh, care too much for, you know, documenting their um, what was going on of the time. But from Israel perspective, this is monumental. This is a brand new nation that is forming. You know, uh, this is history. We need to document every day because this is important to the future. So there's a lot of documentation that we have about this. But Dr. Uh, Rashid Khalidi, after I guess 110 people had died in this battle, sent out a message saying that. The, the He claimed them to be the Haganah or the Jewish forces, but it was really this rogue faction called the Lehi, which was 300 members. That's it. 300 members. They were like a, you know, a glorified like Bloods or Crips gang, you know, that came in and, you know, said, all right, yeah, we'll help the U.S. government. Yeah, we'll go in there and we'll uh, we'll, we'll take over Mexico or, or take over a little town in Mexico. And not under the direction of the Haganah, but they did it on their own. But the Haganah kind of knew about it, so that's why it's highly contested. So the whole point of what I'm saying is this guy who wrote the book, A Hundred Years War, also spread a lie that the Jews raped pregnant women and killed babies in Dir Yassin. And that was supposed to be a calling to basically all the surrounding Arab nations to get them enraged so that they could join forces and they could vanquish Israel. And ultimately, that propaganda worked because radio was very big at the time. It was There was not too much... Um, in, in the form of written press that was coming out immediately, but this message went out and this is what stirred up the whole conflict. So now the, we've expelled everyone, we've killed whole towns, we've bombed people, we've raped women, we've killed babies. And this is not for this one little town of Deir Yassin. This is spread, this is now spread like fucking cancer to everywhere. Now, if they did it in one village, they must be doing it in all of the villages. So the indoctrination comes from this one book and now later to his grandson who is now indoctrinating the wonderful youth that has set up these beautiful encampments outside some of his prestigious universities and in conclusion we're fucked well i, I just got a question it, the test is it could be open book because i wasn't taking notes I, pretty much yeah it's open is there book. a quiz at the end of this yeah, you could you could uh, you know you can refer to the to the video material you know that I'll have here and, every, and everybody watching you know you should subscribe right now press like hit subscribe make sure we'll you wait. follow Paulie Faust and, yeah and get this knowledge and get this history because this is what you guys need. Look, I understand um, that this is the ultimate battle that all of us are trying to fight is the misinformation, uh, the information that that side is getting is all coming from the terror group. They're they're spoon feeding it and look. Let's play any argument you want. Let's play that for a minute that it was their land. There were no such thing as Jews. Then the Jews came in and conquered. Okay, now we conquered it. Now it's ours. I don't see you. You're mad that Israel colonized land. I don't see you advocating to give back the land of the Indians that we came and took. We're colonizers. So you're you're protesting on land that we're occupying that was belonged to the Native Americans. But you're okay with that. Armies and lands get conquered. So even if you believe that Israel wasn't there and they showed up, then there were wars and they've conquered it. That's how the world works. That's how uh, Russia's taken territory. America took territory. It's ours now. If you believe that Israel should give it back, then get out of here and give it back to the Native Americans. So every argument that you try to make falls on deaf ears. You have to learn the facts. And the other thing I will talk to our American youth about, if you've been brainwashed, if you're just getting paid, go look at every single country that has had this assimilation and show me a success story. There are none. They are destroying Europe because wake up kids, they don't like you either. They don't like your music. They don't like the way you dress. They don't like your laws. They don't like your way of life. They don't like your freedoms. We're just the canary in the coal mine. You want to let them in? Once they're in, they're coming for you too. So it, it, the the LBTQ community, you're gone. The girls who want to dress up with their stomachs out, you're gone. Like they're just going. Uh, how about this? First. Girls that girls that want to show their hair, their their hair on their head. 
you can be killed. If, what you, about, if your hair falls out of your hijab under Sharia law, you can be stoned to death. What about a woman just with an opinion? So go look and show me. You have a thriving country in Israel, tiny little speck of dirt that has created jobs, technologies, advancements, medical supplies. This is a thriving country trying to do good in the world. When there's a disaster, the first on scene to help out even countries that don't like them. The first on scene in Haiti with, with when the earthquake, the longest running hospital. This is a small group of people. Now show me the success stories in Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, Jordan. Show me. This is the world you want. Look at what's going on in Europe. We, Israel is a country, and I'm not Israel. I'm an American Jewish person. Was attacked by a terror group. Women raped, babies burned, slaughtered. You have not seen once us out there destroying universities, blocking bridges so you can't get to work, destroying monuments. We are a peaceful people. We are loving people. We are people who want coexistence everywhere, but you're not going to push us down. Okay. We might be small, but you might want to go rent the movie, The 300. 300 strong, brave warriors took on armies because they used tactics. What we're using is facts. They had the tactics of the environment, 300 to hold off armies. We have facts on our side. That's right. And our facts will eventually uh, win this battle because we are fighting an existential threat. And I'm trying to get all the people who are on the fucking sidelines saying, this isn't my battle. This is your battle. It's a battle for your way of life. It's a battle for the communities you want to live in. It's a battle for, for just humanity, period. I mean, there's a certain... There's a certain way of life that is acceptable. The The whole point is that we're fighting an ideology that believes that their life begins at death. How do you fight a threat with that type of ideology that has no real care for life actual on Earth and believe that somewhere after the lights get shut out, their life or their journey begins? It's like how uh, – I know it sounds very insensitive, but how do we allow – something like that to actually exist in this world. Like, just like the Jews throughout the course of millennia for practicing Judaism, they were arrested. They were killed. They were expelled. I feel like with radical <laughs> shit that is damaging to humanity and to people's way of life, there should be no place on this fucking earth for it. Yet yeah, everyone is entitled to believe what you want to believe, but... There's a big butt there. Not if it means that I have to die in order for you to win. And, and, and had you made a mistake and you picked the wrong side, had you all stood with us from the beginning and the world message was release the hostages, stop shooting rockets at Israel, there would have been less death and less destruction. Yes, there are some innocent people in Gaza who've been killed. That's war. Don't embed yourself in the communities. Don't hide. Don't use your people as cannon fodder. But if you would all, countries, students, with one common voice said, return the hostages, stop ro shooting rockets into this country, this would have been over. You empowered Hamas to do what they're doing because they saw it working over here. They saw it working in Europe. Now you can make a decision and stop. You can make a decision and say, I was fooled. I I'm no longer... Do you think people have enough in them? Like, I mean, okay, we'd like to believe that most of us were raised properly so that, you know, we have some moral decency and we have a moral compass. And we, when we realize we fucked up, we can be, be like, I was wrong. Do you think people have enough in them to swallow their pride and actually do that nowadays? No, I, I think there's some that do. I think most will just slither off into the darkness and hope it goes away. They're not going to say I was wrong. They'll just stop. But I also want to encourage everyone to listening, um, your fans, your followers, uh, hopefully some people will follow me, um, is that you all have an obligation. You are all influencers. Don't think because you don't have an audience right now, because you don't have a presence. Maybe you're not even, uh, uh, you don't even post on social media. Go talk to somebody. There are people still sitting on the sidelines. You can educate them. Don't let them only get their information from the other side. Look, I had 2,000 followers on Instagram. I was not a big social media guy. 
after October 7th, I was sitting around watching, getting more upset, getting angry. And maybe the 12th, I decided to just post one video with my feelings from inside. And I woke up the next day to dozens and dozens of messages from around the world. For whatever reason, people said, I needed to hear that. I like the way you said it. It calmed me. Please keep posting. And I was like, shit, now I got to do it again. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I didn't have a voice. Now maybe I do. So don't think, well, I don't have influence. Like, you know, you see someone that's got 20, 30, 40,000 followers. Maybe they, maybe they do. Maybe they influence two people. Maybe you have five followers, but you influence all five. We need everybody to be sharing these messages, everyone to be talking, everyone to be sharing the real facts. Um, it can't just be a handful of influencers putting out videos. We need everybody, Jew and non-Jew, uh, talk to people, explain the position. Don't let them, because they have a very aggressive, funded campaign of disinformation and bots. So please, please, please get off the sidelines. Use whatever voice you have at your workplace, with your friends, online. Let's get more of our message out there. Uh, everything that we have said has been, uh, not everything, almost everything has been right uh, when we get the facts out there. Am I saying Israel's perfect? Am I saying they've made mis not made any mistakes? No, of course they have. It's war. Mistakes are made. But when the facts come out, they are doing everything in their power to prevent the genocide. Israel wants to commit a genocide. It's going to be over in 20 minutes. So right. we need you and we need your voices, not just ours and others. And what I need from people is I need them to stop with these buzzwords with that they have no fucking idea about. I see that in every sentence. And like they'll put they'll just like systematically just put in place apartheid before the state of Israel. And then Israel is committing a genocide and a war crime. And I keep hearing these buzzwords without people really knowing what the fuck they're talking about and saying the genocidal regime. Genocide has to do with intent. If the intent was to kill all the Palestinians, this would not be an eight, nine month dragged out thing. Like it would be clearly like it would be clearly visible by the actions that the IDF has taken. You don't kill less than one person per bomb after dropping 26,000 bombs if you are trying to be intentful in exterminating a people. You would not be offering any sort of peace resolutions. You'd be going in there, guns blazing, to find all of the hostages, and then as soon as the hostages are found, Gaza turns into one gigantic, big, shiny piece of glass. You wouldn't, you wouldn't send food in and water you wouldn't lose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of brave IDF soldiers, teenagers, you know, 20. You wouldn't sacrifice them. Is, you want to commit a genocide, you car bomb the country in 20 minutes. There's no defense system. Israel is the only country in the world that tells you where they're going to bomb, that drops materials, that begs you to leave. Is there a genocide being committed? 100%. 100%. By Hamas. Hamas. They are stealing the, they are stealing the food. They are, they are putting their people... Uh, in, in harm's way. If they try and flee, they kill them. They are hiding the hostages amongst them. They are committing a genocide on their own people. Israel is doing everything in their power to not only prevent it, but free the Palestinians from that rule. Okay? And if you don't believe that, then please reach out to me and tell me why the leaders of Hamas are billionaires and don't live in Gaza. Explain that to me. If you could explain rationally why the leaders of a terror organization are multi-billionaires and, and don't, don't even live, live in, there and don't live there, convince me that they're not the ones who are corrupt, that they are not the ones trying to kill their own people, that they are the ones that don't care. I don't you, understand how you are falling for the propaganda. I don't get it. And if and the other message I put out there before is. You want to go march for BDS to boycott divestment and sanctions? I'll respect you when you go all in, which means you don't have an no iPhone. More iPhone. No ways. Get rid of your medicines. Check your cabinet for everything developed in Israel. Make sure your parents don't go in for surgeries that were created in Israel. Stop being a half-assed keyboard warrior. Go all That's in. Right.
Right. Don't just take a bottle of Coke and, and throw it out and say, oh, I, I've uh, I've protested products for Israel. Get you throw your yeah. fucking phone out. Might as well. And, and any clothes that you're wearing, any music that you're listening to, because the technology and the advances that Israel has done given to the fucking world. And if you're Boy, the LGBT, and, and if you want and if you stand for this in the LGBT community and you really believe in this and you're going to give me this argument, well, I can't go to Gaza right now. I can't get in. Good. Go to a neighboring country. Get yourself yeah. over to Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and tell them, because you can get there. I'll help you. I am proudly gay, proudly lesbian, proudly trans, and I want to help you guys out with relief, whatever. Go there. Let's see how you are treated. Actually, I mean, let's see how, uh, I mean, I'd like to see the distance, you know, like the way they fly off the roof. I want to see what kind of what kind of distance they can get. I mean, like we'll take bets and see. Like, I mean, maybe it'll be ten meters, maybe it'll be fifteen meters. You yeah. know, first we'll do, first we'll do the height of the building, and then and we'll, we'll do the that. length. Then we'll do the length in which they'll be thrown. So, yeah, for let's, anyone that's let's thinking, play I played this game with so many people. Uh, name the only country in the entire Middle East where women have equal rights. Like, I don't know. It's Israel. Okay, let's go again. Name the only country in the entire Middle East. Where the gay community is equal rights. Yeah, once again. Oh, you know what, Ged? Yeah. Syria. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no. Iraq. No. Nope. Jordan. No. No, no. Israel. Israel. You Israel. got it. Right. But ding, ding. Okay. La last one. Name the only country in the entire Middle East where Arabs and Muslims have equal rights. Arabs and Muslims have equal rights. Where? What country in the Middle East? Uh, Israel. Israel. It's Israel. So wake up, people. If you've been standing on the wrong side, get off that side. If you've been standing on no side, join us. And if you've been standing on our side, but quiet, stop being quiet. Put the messages out there. We need to win this war because the war for the existence of the planet as we know it. That's why I'm doing I was never, you know, I don't know one one thousandth of the facts you do, but I am I am Jewish. I am also a human, and I am not going to sit on the sidelines again. Um, I am, I'm going to use my voice, whatever that is, and whoever you know wants to be moved by my words, I'm going to keep doing it because I'm not just fighting for Jews. I'm fighting for the way of life that I want to leave, the world I want to leave to my children, um, and that's why it's so important to me. Hey, listen, Paul, you're a beautiful person, and I respect you. Like, I mean, the, the words that you say – like from your Instagram, like resonated so well with me. I was like, I was like, I don't care if he doesn't follow me back. I was like, I'm fucking, I'm, I'm liking everything. I'm commenting everything because it's like, uh, I felt like you deserved to have, you know, light shined on you because the shit that you went through with the jet blue, you know, first right. of all, and, and, and the fact that you are such an unapologetic Jew, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a breath of fresh air to see, uh, to see one of my own kind, <laughs> you know, that, but, uh, but, it, that but, but it's also cool to see all of our different kinds. I met I met influencers who were attacking, or I don't like the word influencer. I met people who were attacking this from a comedy perspective because they're using their humor. I've met people attacking from an aggressive, you want to F with me perspective. I've met people who want to talk about facts and politics. We, we all have our own voice. Mm. Um, I'm not doing it to build a brand. I'm not doing it to build a podcast. I'm not doing it to make money. I'm doing it because I was sitting here and it, I was getting upset and angry and I wanted to I didn't want it to well up inside. I didn't think that anybody would care. And I honestly didn't care if anybody cared. I just wanted to share my voice. And then it turns out that it did affect some people. So if I have that ability, then I have an obligation to affect people in a positive way. And if it takes time, okay. And if it takes taking some shots, having my business attacked, having me personally attacked, okay. I was I was going to get to that. I'm going to take those shots because I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to walk in fear, which is why when the whole JetBlue thing happened, at first I said they fucked with the wrong guy. And then I said, no, they fucked with, fuck the, with right the, right guy. Guy. the right guy. Because I wasn't going to back down and I was going to handle it the right way because maybe it's an older person or someone who's afraid and just took the attack. Um, and I think we all need to start doing that. Um, I mean, you said you said something that, uh, you know, again, very, very profound, which, uh, you know, it uh, I'm going to steal a quote from uh, the movie National Treasure, where Nicolas Cage is reading off the Declaration of Independence. And he says, you know, those that have the ability to act have the responsibility to act. 
So, and that's, you know, similar to what you said. And it's like, if I have the ability to speak up, then I feel like it's my responsibility to speak up, you know, at the risk of alienating people that are not of the same mind state and do not agree with what Israel is doing. And, you know, even though like, I mean, me personally, I probably lost about 10, 10 to 15,000 followers. And out of those 10 to 15,000 followers, probably a couple of thousand were like real, real close with me that like stayed with me for years. So it's like speaking up, I don't think people realize the risk that we're taking by doing so. It's like in, in a way we are alienating everybody that does not agree with our way of life, which in my mind, it's not a humane way of living if you're not agreeing with the right side of history. But you're entitled to your opinion and you're entitled to leave and don't let the door hit you on the way out. You know, in fact, let me, you know, use a Spartan kick, you know, to kick the door closed and say, this is Judea. And then boom. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's true. I, I, I'm OK. Um, but I also believe that for all of all of us and others, it's okay to have conversations offline. There's some people that want to, um, that when you're online, they have to protect their image or they're this. But when I meet them in person, I said, let's talk. Why are you feeling this? What? And they go, like, I, I travel a lot, go to a lot of events. And I'm still amazed at, at people come up to me and said, hey, Paul, can you explain what's going on over there? Like, I don't really know. I'm like, since October 7th you still don't know like whose land with it who's right why is israel doing this why i'm like all right let's sit down and talk so you can't assume that everybody knows all the facts and they're just choosing a side based on separate sets of facts there are lots of people out there in this country who have done this like and, and if you don't believe me i'll ask your audience this can you tell me the last few cities that russia has bombed in ukraine can you tell me what's going on now? I can't. Why? Because I don't pay attention as much to that. So don't assume that everybody's paying attention to the Middle East. A lot of them, when, when Israel news comes on, they switch channels because they don't believe they have a dog in this fight. And you may or may not think you do, but trust me, go look at what's going on in Europe. Go look at the groups. In the, if, let me tell you, and I put it this way to people, let's assume you have no facts. Zero facts about the, the Israel-Gaza-Palestine uh, conflict. Zero. We all have zero. And I just have you watch a series of videos that don't talk about the war. You see one group of people marching peacefully with flags saying, we want peace. We want our hostages back. And you see another group of videos of people who are destroying our cities, destroying our universities, vandalizing monuments, attacking police officers attacking elderly couples at their place of worship and restaurants. Which group do you want to side with? Show me a video of a group of Jews destroying property, threatening people. Uh, I'd love, I would love to see that shit. I'm sorry. Show me. Sorry. It's not us. So there's two sides. Forget all the data and the facts of who's right, who's wrong. Which group do you want to stand with? The group that wants to, by the way, for you at all those universities that aren't Jewish, they disrupted your graduation. You spent four years earning a degree you should be very proud of. They didn't care that they ruined the graduation for you and that your parents didn't get to see you walk and get the degree you earned. They didn't care about you. They disrupted a graduation at a university that has nothing to do with the IDF in Israel. That's right. And let's not remember four years ago when you first went into college, what were we going through? We were going through the worst fucking disaster of fucking COVID where it was remote learning and you really didn't get, you know, the, the proper education like you wanted to in the setting that you wanted to within the classroom. And four years later, after all the work that you've done, they have fucked up your momentous occasion of graduation. That's what you're going to have to remember. For what? And that's who you want to stand with when they block a bridge that your family might be using as an ambulance to get to the hospital. They don't care about you. Remember, when they went into Israel, they went to the No Festival, they didn't kill Israelis. They killed everybody, Mexican, Thais, Germans, French, etc. So here's not the final point because we're not done yet, but you have two choices and two choices only. Stand with me, right next to me, and fight this battle with me, or don't be anywhere near me because when they come for me, they're taking you too. They're not going to check your papers. When they launch an attack, you're coming too, okay? They don't care. 
They don't care if you're uh, Italian, Greek, Protestant, Catholic. When they attack, everybody is cannon fodder. If they're, only coming, you want they're, only come, they're only coming after us because we're the smallest. Like once yeah. once they vanquish us, we are the smallest. Yes, we're considered to be the strongest, but I don't know how, you know, 0.2% of the entire world's population runs anything. And if we if we ran the media, me and you would not have to be sitting on this podcast talking about it, trying to get our message out to the masses to break that echo chamber to let people know, hey, this shit is fucked up. If the if the Jews really ran the world, the Jexit page wouldn't be suspended. Israeli influencers wouldn't be attacked online and shadow banned, you know, in every way, shape, or form. Like we would not be losing the PR world if the Jews ran the world. So let that be a lesson to everybody. The Jews don't run shit. This is all part of a propaganda machine. It's almost considered a blood libel because there's barely any Jews in the fucking world. <laughs> there's 15 million Jews versus 2.3 billion Muslims. And we're, we're, and we're, by the way, because you know history well, I don't, is not even close. Where are most of us? Um, where were we? You want when you want to throw out words like genocide, and, and there were Jews in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, other parts of it. Rush. Where are most of them? They've been driven out. No Jews there. That's called the genocide. That's and, and Arab, that's you know what they want to use the word ethnic cleansing. That is the perfect example sample. of ethnic cleansing. Like right. you can't. You can't claim ethnic cleansing because of the Nakba, because of a because of a war that people fled to not be bombed by either side. And there's a very, very documented case um, where Benny Morris, who's the, the all time historian and the the go to guy with all the facts on everything, because he's actually investigated the archives and he's considered by everyone to be probably one of the most authentic and genuine uh you know, authors and historians of the time that says that the majority were actually asked to leave or expelled by their own Arab leaders because they had privy information about when a pending battle was coming to their neck of the woods. So this whole thing of, you know, all the Arab leaders told, you know, told everyone to leave. No, they didn't. They, they forced them to leave because they knew that there was a battle coming. OK, they actually thought that they were going to be able to vanquish Israel and then people would return. But people are not stupid. They say, OK, a battle is coming soon. We're getting the fuck out of here. I, I mean, it, it, in some cases, they were told to stay to offer some level of resistance. And that was the first kind of usage of human shields where they said, no, if you guys stay, that'll that'll deter, you know, the 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 uh, the Leahy or the Haganah or the Ergun from you know coming coming and you know destroying the town and village because there's all people there. But there was a policy in place that if there were acts of violence against Jews and settlements, you know, by Arabs prior to the war, um, they would attract them to the neighboring Arab countries and cause some damage. Basically, if you do this, we're going to come back and do this tenfold because we ha we don't have anywhere else to go. You we need to know that. The loss of Israeli life is worth 10 of yours so, to not do it again. So it was a deterring factor. So it, it, see, this is what I learned at, at the uh, at the Voice for Summit. There are people with different voices. You come from a, a, a very knowledgeable, historic data. Plus, you're old. I come from this world that, that I just open my eyes and I look and I make a, and I make kind of decisions and assumptions. And I say to myself, when I just look around and, and then I only share when something hits me. And again, I keep talking to the other side, these, these disenfranchised kids who think they know what they're doing. And I say to them, forget everything else again. Forget whose land it was. Forget occupation. Forget this. Tonight, if you're listening to this and you put your head on the pillow, if the people in Gaza, the Palestinians, are so right in this conflict, why is it? This is the only thing I want you to think about. Why is it that not one of their Arab Muslim brother countries have opened their doors to them? Why is it that Egypt, their Arab Muslim brothers, have fortified their fence? And when the Palestinians are pushed up against this fence from the horrible IDF that's out to get them, Egypt didn't say, we're opening it up, come in here, stay here safely, we'll feed you and protect you. 
Why is it that no one is coming to their rescue of their brethren? Why? I want you to ponder that question because they can. They're up in Rafa against the border fence. They could have opened it. Instead, you know what he's just doing? Fortifying the fence, making it stronger. In fact, that fence is so impressive. I would like to hire the Egyptians to build ours for us at, at our southern border because it's a good fence. So say to yourself, why are none of their brethren coming to their aid and offering? Why hasn't Jordan Levitt said, hey, Israel, if you give us a two-week pause, we'll bring in planes and we'll bring people out so you could fight the bad guys. Why? Only think about that. The funny Forget thing, well, there's the nothing, yeah, there's nothing funny about it. But um, So the answer to that, so when I would answer, somebody from the pa pro-Palestinian side would then accuse me of making a racist statement by saying something that's true. So the answer to that is, why have none of the surrounding Arab nations opened up their doors and taken in any Palestinian refugees? The answer, and the truthful answer, is they don't want to. They don't want them. And then I would be, I would be attacked for making a racist statement saying that you know the surrounding Arab nations don't want their Palestinian brothers. Then I would ask you then, so explain to me why. And then I'll just sit there like this. But... And the answer, there is a why, by the way, because every country they've gone into, they've tried to overthrow and take over and cause trouble. But guess what? Also, while your head's on the pillow, say to yourself, who are the countries that have extended their hand in peace to Israel? Every single one that has extended their hand in peace has gotten it. Israel conquered Egypt in the war where they were attacked. Egypt said, we want peace. Israel said, yes. Gave them back the land they conquered, and they've lived in peace. Jordan said, we would like peace. Israel said, we want peace. And there's been basically no conflicts with those two. Every country that is willing to have peace, Israel wants peace with. Every single peace deal offered to the other side has been rejected because they do not want peace. This is who you are standing with, American disenfranchised kids. I'm not talking to the others, to the others, but you who think that you're on some path to righteousness because you've been brainwashed. You were probably out there protesting Occupy Wall Street. You were probably mad at the guy who went to Africa and shot a lion, even though he did nothing wrong. They've taught you to always go after the one with who seems to be powerful. You've been brainwashed. Get off that train. Because listen to me, I don't know how to make this any clearer. We ain't losing. We ain't going anywhere. And we remember you. We know who you are. We're tracking your names. We're tracking your social media accounts. We're going to make sure employers know who you are. You are on the wrong side. And I'm going to show up at your house and fuck your mother. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. I don't know where that came from. My apologies. <laughs> we'll fix that in post. Um, <laughs> you know, you watch what's going on. You are not going to win. Well said. It's going to be pain and loss, but you want a country, you want jobs. If you're doing this for the money, for 40 bucks an hour for a few months, mistake. Get off the bus. Yeah, that's not going to sustain your your um your life at um, you know, $40 an hour, you know, uh protesting <laughs> causing causing some ruckus. And Either and when you get and when you get arrested, uh I'm pretty sure they're not going to pay your bail. I mean, I have no idea if they're even doing bail anymore, you know. And, with what's and going it's on. not too late to switch degrees. Your degree in ancient Roman of pottery and its use in theatrical performances of the economic revolution are, I'm not looking for that on the resume. So get off the side of death, get off the side of destruction and join the side that just wants to live in peace, that just wants to prosper, that just wants to give to the planet. And we're beautiful people. The Jews are, I mean, listen, for the most part, I mean, we got assholes in all societies, but for the most part, Jews, we're, we're pretty beautiful people. We know how it feels to be fucking shitted on, and it's kind of like in our DNA already from thousands of years of being persecuted. So all we want to do is, you know, just we just want to live in peace and coexist, and we want to live we want to live that life that we were meant to live. And you know, I'll say something to the people that are watching while your head is on the pillow. I do, I too believe all the Palestinians should have equal rights. I do, I really do. I believe that they should have every single equal right as every single individual citizen 
in all the surrounding Arab nations. I, I agree with you. And they, and, they should and, have the same rights as every single Arab nation around them. They are more like the Arab nation than they are Israeli than the Israeli people. They don't respect the Israeli people's policy. They don't respect the uh, Israeli government. They don't uh, they don't even respect Israel even to exist. But I do believe they should have equal rights. And since they are most like the surrounding Arab nations, the same rights that the beautiful people of all of those nations enjoy. <laughs> Palestinians should be able to enjoy those equal rights, just like their Muslim brothers in all of the surrounding Arab nations. They don't respect Israel. Why are we going to give them the same rights as the people of Israel? They don't. They don't want to be citizens of Israel. They don't want to have the same rights as Israelis. They 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 want to have you know some sort of rights, but they should have equal rights as every single surrounding country. Same rights in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Egypt. I am all for that. It's, it's a victimhood mentality, and they like it. Um, they need us as an enemy because it drives money for them. Um, and as my dear friend, you know, Ed Lake said to me a few times, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, the Jews are the chosen people. You know what? Choose somebody else for a minute. Like, yeah, for real. <laughs> choose, so we've been chosen enough. And guess what? Every group that has chosen us to try and wipe us out no longer exists. So do yourself a favor. Choose someone else. Go choose ISIS for a bit. Go mess with the choose. Go, go choose the, the 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 gang somewhere. Leave us alone. We just want to thrive and have our. And that's why, by the way, that's why the news doesn't. You know, the news shows that these people out there destroying bridges and universities and yelling and violence. Why? Because it's exciting to watch. We're not that exciting to videotape. Why? Because what do we do? We go to work. We spend time with our families. We, yeah, why are we, we got jobs. We, we have, have families. <laughs> like, we don't have the luxury of being out all day in the street protesting when we got families, we've got lives. Not all of us are funded by, you know, the billionaires in Qatar, you know, Qatar, Qatar, however you guys are, tomato, tomato, however you pronounce it nowadays. Like, we actually have to work and make a living. So it's like, you know, yeah, they're going to outnumber us with protests all the time because we have that thing called um, really – responsibility there we go so so we're not that fun to put on camera but look and for those jews who who are out there afraid let me tell you something i've traveled now since october 7th to i think about 10 or 12 cities in the united states vegas new orleans scottsdale new york boston uh, savannah georgia atlanta georgia i've been all over i have yet to been a, be attacked with hate i have seen more people who have seen my uh, my Jewish, my necklace, my shirts, and said, I stand with you. I'm proud of you. I have not been attacked that way. The news wants to make it seem like you got to hold yourself up in your basement because they're everywhere, um, because they follow that noise. Be proud. Don't be afraid. Go about your life. Don't let these these people win when they scare you away from your way of life. Exactly. Don't let them. When you show them that you're going to go out to dinner, you're going to go to the theater, you're going to go to work, you're going to spend time with your friends, that we are not afraid, they lose. The win is when we tremble. And if you're watching the pattern, they are, they are on their way this way. They are realizing that we are not trembling. We are not going anywhere. And so do not be afraid. Yes, I'm not saying that there aren't violent protesters out there in certain pockets. But they're not everywhere. I am telling you, in 10 to 12 cities, I've yet to see one. I have yet to be attacked. I wear proud uh, Jewish shirts on planes and I get smiles. I've never had someone give me a dirty look, except on JetBlue, once. Uh, and that, was a, <laughs> it is one, that one little caveat right there. But, but it wasn't JetBlue. It was one flight attendant. Um, so be proud. Do not be afraid. Do not let the media convince you that, you know, that the, that the world right now or the U.S. is on fire and you have to hide everything. Do not. Because when they see us standing proud, they're going to realize this is a battle and this is a people we will never defeat because we are on the right side of history. Amen. Amen. Well said. Well said. And I, I think we'll wrap it up on that because I can't. I don't think we could, you know, end it in, with, a, with a better slogan or a better, you know, um, advice for the people to actually, you know, take these words and 
and let them register. Let them really, really register. Don't just take them and let them go in one year and out the other. They really need to absorb because what you said is 100% authentic and it's very genuine and it's coming from a genuine person. It's coming from my heart and, and we should end it on this. Even if um, we haven't met you yet and you're a follower of of this podcast of, of Joe Paul or me, we may be strangers, but we are already best friends. Fuck Let yeah. that stick with you. When Absolutely. we meet, we are not strangers. We may be strangers, but we're best friends. I love it. Absolutely love it. And I like to leave you with a quote that I like to attribute to my life. I'd like you to attribute to yours. And I encourage every one of my followers to please do the same. We're all just here for a small cup of coffee. I'm just trying to drink it while it's still hot. I'm your boy. I am Joe Paul. And by the way, we are sponsored by the good people at Perspective Fitness. Never again. Please make sure you stand with us. Go cop your T-shirt and show your support. Never again. I'm your boy, boy, I am Joe Paul. This has been the Verified Podcast. We've been rocking it out with cool guy, Paulie Fowles. Make sure you follow him on all social media platforms. Reach out. Say what's up. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. And we are out of here. One love. Peace. I love y'all.